I have yet to meet a human being who doesn't want to live where there is more shared prosperity because that is good for business, that's good for people, that's good for my family, it's good for my friends on a healthy planet. I don't know anybody who doesn't want that. Everybody wants clean air, good food that doesn't kill you, healthcare, education for your children. We agree on so much more, but we are now stuck labeling each other and every issue in very divisive ways. And the only way we can transcend that is by coming together in very new ways to create the future we want and and need. Hi, how how are you? I'm good. I missed you guys. How are you doing? We're doing good. Are you out of are you out of COVID? I don't know that we're out of it. In in here in LA right now, talking was pretty good, but we were just talking before you got on. There's the challenge now of one of the J and J vaccines. I'm not sure if you saw that news. Yeah, I I've it's complicated when it comes to the production. It's not as simple as it sounds. It sounds greater than it is in execution because actually developing vaccines or producing them is takes years to get to the standard. And so probably what we should be trying to do more of is sort of um, partnerships um, between existing uh, producers who could, so we can produce more. And there is more of that happening between pharma companies than ever before in their um, collective history um, because pre-competitive or pre Competitive collaboration didn't really exist in business and doesn't really exist, but needs to exist when it comes to climate, when it comes to tackling a challenge like this. Um, So we are learning, but it's just not happening fast enough. But I wish it was just as easy as we could produce it near the markets that need it. But I've been told by people who know far more than me about this, that getting facilities up to speed that can actually produce vaccine up to a safe standard. You can see we already have challenges even in very um, developed facilities uh, that that that's more complex than uh, me as a lay person will be able to explain. Um, so we probably need to be doing some kind of joint ventures more to get the production capacity up. We also need to be working much more I think on learn on capturing the lessons because we're still learning a lot about what works and what doesn't work. And I think the most likely scenario we're in is this is going to stretch out a, a, quite a bit longer because it didn't have to, but it's pretty much lack of um, collective coordinated effort that's leaving us there. And we will need to um, probably live in different ways for a while. We'll probably need boosts to the vaccines and we'll probably need to get used to some measures for longer than any of us would like to, including traveling with masks and, you know, using, because this is not the last pandemic we'll see in a hundred years either. Yeah. You know, um, we did a project a couple of years ago um, where we were working with CERN and there was a group, um, I think they were, maybe in um they were in germany or or they were somewhere or maybe greece and they had decided to take their experiment to cern and you know i asked them why they did that and they said because science is bigger than any one country right and so it didn't make sense that they would do this thing somewhere else it made sense that they would pull their resources in some senses is what's needed on climate and and what's needed on um pandemics, uh, a rethinking of, you know, sort of nationalism and globalism and all these terms, you know, we're going to have to have more cooperation to deal with these things. Mm. I think that is, you hit it spot on, because the solutions to many of our challenges, including the pandemic exist. And also, I could say to some extent, and maybe even to a large extent on what we need to do to tackle the climate crisis, and I would even go further, the planetary crisis. 
I also think we've known for a very long that our inequality is at levels that are unsustainable for any of us, including those who have. It's just not possible to protect a system that um, with so much social unrest. But our inability to lead in a way that works for these massive global challenges in an era where trust is so low in all institutions in society is in the way of us effectively leading and coordinating the kind of radical collaboration that's needed to meet the moment uh, with the solutions we already have to a large extent. So take, for example, we, we are still questioning business questions, the role of government, government or civil society questions, uh, the responsibility of business, uh, business leaders question if activists and this next generation is out of their mind. So we're still like fighting against each other instead of recognizing our interdependence. And we're also still talking about climate without recognizing biodiversity to a large extent. Uh, we're, we, we talk about the reduction of greenhouse gas being needed, and we absolutely need it. But we are sort of in a separate track almost talking about natural based solutions, which is part of it, and circularity and consumption, which has to be part of it. And we don't even address the fact that all of the solutions we have may have left a lot of people People thinking that they will be left further behind because the whole movement in climate talks a lot about we have to get out of this, we have to do this, these terrible things are happening. We talk so much about the fear and the problems and the loss of things and so little about the fact that we created this world and we are very well capable of creating the world we want and need. But we can probably only do it by working together and by being stubbornly optimistic um, that working together is going to deliver a world that's good for all of us. And instead, we're busy othering, we're busy separating issues. So we need more holistic leadership. We need much, much more courage. We need a lot more humility about the solutions coming from any one direction. And um, yeah, this is the greatest time to be alive oh. because we can deliver this future. But we have to choose to do it. You know, um, in uh, the financial crisis in in um, Iceland, you know, did at, at the beginning of the crisis, how how bad did it feel? And then, you know, Iceland is a very special place. So how did how did you decide to run for office? And and you know, what did what did the people of Iceland do before we even addressed the problem? Hmm. Well, in order to properly answer that question, I almost need to go back pre the financial crisis because we had a number of years where we had real fast growth within our small economy. And as a matter of fact, from in a two year time frame, our banking system grew from being something around four times the size of our economy, which is already big. It's the size of like Luxembourg or Switzerland, it's like big financial countries and Iceland is a fisheries country and not a financial uh, country. And it grew from that to 10 to 12 times the size of the economy over uh, the course of two years. And it grew because it had access to, to inexpensive leverage, inexpensive debt that big banks all over the world were keen to lend to fast growing banks and businesses. And so it was leverage growth, which we should have learned in the 80s in the US always comes to a sad ending. But so when leverage dried up um, before the financial crisis, Iceland was in trouble. And at that time, I, together with another woman, co-founded an investment firm with a different vision. And we decided, you know, creating profit or growth at the expense of anything was not satisfying to us. It wasn't aligning with our values. We didn't believe it was sustainable. And we had that audacious idea that we could create an investment firm with um, and incorporate more feminine values into how we did business. And to us, that was all about reaching profit on the back of some really clear principles. Uh, it was all about not just doing financial due diligence when choosing investments, but also do emotional due diligence. It was all about um, profit with purpose or profit with principles. And that took us into sort of the space of creating ESG 
criteria and and the um, for our private equity work it um, which is very very common now but back then wasn't very common yeah this is 14 years ago so very few people even knew what it was and as a matter of fact we weren't able to use any sophisticated tools at the time because they didn't exist so we were coming up with what what kind of things should companies be setting objectives and measurements for if they want to take care of their environment, their social fabric, and, and they want to excel at, at uh, governance? We were looking at that and we had this idea that I used to call it ESG square uh, because to me it was about environmental responsibility and social responsibility. But the G was really a lever that I thought was so interesting. And I looked at it as almost that transformative lever. And I always thought about two Gs. Gender, I just thought, I really believed that the financial sector had gone off track because there was such sameness in the sector. Everybody kind of looked, felt, thought the same way, same age, same school, same gender, you know, same race. It just, there was total lack of anybody who questioned or, or asked questions or challenged challenged what I now call a crisis of conformity, which easily forms when all leaders look, feel the same and come from the same backgrounds. And the other G I was very occupied with was really this generational idea, because as a mom to uh, two kids at the time, I then young boy and a girl, I just thought, how can we go on like this and expect our children not to inherit a world that is a total mess? And what kind of a parent does that? What kind of a mother does that? So I had this early idea then, but so you asked me about the financial collapse. We had a very young, small investment firm uh, when the financial collapse happened in Iceland, but it did take down nearly the entire financial sector, but our small firm survived intact and in fact went on to grow and and shift a lot of the narrative and ideas in the financial sector. And probably my favorite effort that I participated in that I often think about in the moment we're in today, in the aftermath of that financial collapse, was that I came together with people from all walks of life. We had a a pop star, a a minister, an entrepreneur, an investor, a business leader, a theater director, people from the arts, um, grassroots activists coming together and designing what we then called a national assembly, really bringing together about a half a percentage of the Icelandic nation to talk about what, you know, we've, we've had a total collapse. There's anger in the street. Icelanders angry, I should note, they hit, you know, they, they came out to the streets with pots and pans. That was you know, some threw eggs, and I'm not saying it was nice, but uh, unlike in America where guns are brought out at a moment right. like this, there was a relatively peaceful demonstrations, but they were angry for Iceland. Uh, people were upset. They didn't believe in the system. They they felt that all trust was broken. The social contract was broken. And so part of rebuilding from that um, probably started at this national assembly that was Um, a citizen effort a year after the collapse where we discussed what should be the vision for the future we want. What should be the values that we hold near and dear to the way things work in Iceland. And I discovered that in the most deeply divided country, because this is the the most deeply divided Iceland has ever been, as human beings, we agreed on far more than you would have thought if you just watched our media or showed up for our demonstrations. We, as human beings, as mother, as fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters, um, as citizens, we have a pretty seared belief in what kind of a future will serve us now, and our was families. That, was that the, the emotional part of business? Was it an extension of that? And, and how did you all talk about that in a common way? Because you know, in a demonstration, people aren't talking about that. So no. how does it become, you know, this is a, this is something, um, this is something about Iceland and about the way people in Iceland speak with one another. Yes, possibly. Although I like to think of Iceland's purpose in the world as a small country that can punch above its weight by piloting really bold and brave ideas. And you can go back in history and say when women took the day off in 1975 and refused to work and nothing worked in Iceland, that that was 
sort of not just the beginning of the closing the gender gap in Iceland. It really was a story that's traveled far and wide and brought more gender equality to more places. So, um, and I could say the same about sustainable energy, but I think the whole idea that uh, uh, a nation from all walks of life, we literally chose people randomly from the national registry to participate in this. And we've worked with some of the leading academics and thinkers to create a process that allows us to find common ground. And there are great many thinkers out there. We used sort of a home cooked method building on some of the best ones. But my favorite method out there that I'm really thinking hard about today is called appreciative inquiry, which is very much about bringing people together, looking at the strengths we have, building from the strengths we have, building on kind of what are some of the some of the assets we have, whether we are a company trying to reset our ways, individuals trying to find a better way in the world or a whole society or a community. And I think this is a time in history where we need reset dialogues, where we need to bring all stakeholders in communities in or, you know, in and around organizations, in and around many of those international processes together to reset our ways, because we are essentially keeping, we keep going very well aware that we are working in broken systems. And that just is constantly leaving us in more and more difficult place when it comes to climate, inequality, trust. Um, now with the COVID crisis, we are doing what Einstein called insanity, doing more of the same and expecting a different outcome. And I'm a huge believer that systems can take on a life of their own if there's too much sameness in them. There's a crisis of conformity in most boardrooms because the people that sit around the boardroom tables have more and less all have the same experiences. They look and feel the same and think the same. And this is a moment, just like Iceland was after the collapse in 2008, where we need to think again about everything. Adam Grant has come out with a fantastic book called Think Again where he marries sort of social science with stories of people who have found the courage to think again. And we right. need to think again everywhere right now and not just keep doing things that are leaving us with a burning planet and a broken social contract. You know, Hala, do you think that, you know, there's people that really prospered, sadly enough, during this time? There's companies, there's individuals, there's more, I think there's more billionaires or something insane like this. So you're talking, we need a consensus and we need buy-in. And as you say, at least here in the United States, there's just incredible rage right now and anger for so many reasons, justifiable reasons. So as we're thinking about this reset, you know, a couple of things, and I'd like to sort of also for our people watching and listening, Hala has done many things in her life. She's an extraordinary woman, but right now she is the CEO of the B team which is a very unusual and a progressive, I hope to say, progressive way of taking us into the future. So a little context about the B team, but also in your, with your incredible group of leaders, how do we think of a reset that's gonna take more people along? The B team is a group of leaders who came together in the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2008. And they were founded around 2013 after several people were talking about the fact that business as usual would no longer be an option. We were running out of time on climate, on social cohesion and trust, and um, we were facing corruption in so many ways still, even after we had left so many people further behind during the financial crisis in 2008. And since then, our global leaders have been trying to uplift the vision and I'm very ambitious and bold vision for how we can deliver a world that is carbon neutral by 2050 or before, how we can create 100% human workplaces and close all of these inequality gaps we have in the in the world and how we can start building trust through better governance, better metrics, better models and better leadership. And all of this is, is around this idea that companies can and should be in service of humanity. They should embrace that as their purpose and not just the pursuit of financial profit. But the idea is also that if you do that, all of your stakeholders will be so motivated by that. And that is sort of the call of the day that you will also create more profit 
long term and it will be sustainable profit. So that's sort of the background of the B team. And you asked me, I think your question is, um, what has happened during COVID? Because we had that enormous global financial crisis in 2008 that revealed the broken system, but we pretty much went back to business as usual. Maybe more change than we realize because change in uh, society and global systems takes a long time. And maybe there was a greater awakening then than we see at least, uh, but we did not fix anything fast. We just had a lot of conversation about it. Then came COVID. We accelerated inequality massively during this last year. Trust is at an all time low. Democracies the world over have faced greater challenges. We're very focused always on what's going on in America, but there's actually been rollback of democratic rights in more than 80 countries in the world. Uh, we were facing challenges before COVID, but they were all accelerated during COVID. So I think the 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 and COVID may have come because of climate change, even if I'm not going to try to be a scientist, and we may have more pandemics because of that. And all of these challenges are inter linked and interrelated. We cannot tackle any one of them without thinking about the others. And that's very much what we're trying to do on the B team. There is absolutely no way in a broken system, broken social contract, where so many people feel that the system has done them wrong and rightfully feel that way, um, will buy into solutions that come from the global elite alone. I'm sorry to say this because I wish we weren't in this place, but the only way we can co-create a path towards a better future is by listening a lot more to people from all parts of the system that is broken. That means that the grassroots need to come together with those sitting in the boardrooms. And um, that means that in a city, you need to bring together business leaders, local governments, activists, uh, small and medium enterprises, your supply chain, you really need to start thinking about the whole system and tackling our challenges in a much more holistic way. I have yet to meet a human being who doesn't want to live where there is more shared prosperity, because that is good for business, that's good for people, that's good for my family, it's good for my friends, on a healthy planet. I don't know anybody who doesn't want that. Everybody wants clean air, good food that doesn't kill you, healthcare, education for your children. We agree on so much more, but we are now stuck in um, labeling each other and every issue in very divisive ways. And mm. the only way we can transcend that is by coming together in very new ways to create the future we want and, and need. You know, you, um, uh, so you run for, to, to be the leader of Iceland, you, you come in number two with, with 30%. Were you, were you surprised by the result? I mean, that's very, to go from not being a politician to being a politician, that that's a pretty good result. No. <laughs> yeah. I, um, Particularly when you consider the fact that 45 days before election day, I had 1% in the polls, probably the hardest sort of professional setback <laughs> I faced uh, in many ways. I faced many of those, but I was an unlikely candidate, no political background. I ran with little preparation because I was encouraged to run rather um, uh, to my surprise. And I was encouraged by the next generation. And to be honest, I didn't really want to do it. Uh, I'll, I'll be quite honest. I had a good life and um, putting yourself out there, putting your neck out there to be a leader anywhere is challenging now. You know, the way social media is and when you are a mother to teenage children and you're a woman and so you have a husband and all, you know, all of the people you love and who make you happy are going to pay for your decision to be a leader today. It's not easy. It's so, much easier to say no. <laughs> so you you decide to to be the leader of the B team. Now, what's the first board meeting with? I mean, because the people on this board are sort of incredible. Christine Figueres, you know, uh, Mary Robinson, Mo Abraham. You know, these are not uh, lightweight people. This is a very unusual group of people. What was that first board meeting, the first time you interacted with all of them? you know, and many others, you know, what was that like? 
Well, I knew a few of them from before because I've cared so much about trying to improve our system that I had come across some of the B team leaders in global conversations about the need to reform the financial system or get more women leaders or a lot of things I cared about. And so, and I met quite many of them when they were choosing their CEO, because that was certainly quite a process. But my first meeting was around the boardroom table at Mark Benioff's Salesforce Ohana floor in San Francisco in 2018. It was around the Global Climate Action Summit that was held in San Francisco at the time. And I was then, and you know, um, as perhaps understandable, even if I ran for president and all of that, still felt quite intimidated by the characters around the table. Yeah, I think it's fair to say I had a full-blown imposter syndrome hit me, meaning like, who am I to, to be here hurting these, these great global leaders into, um, into uh, the future or into making a difference in the world, which they all were making in their own right and together. They had done incredible things before I came around. But you know what? It's interesting when um, when you are given the opportunity to lead. And I am firmly of the opinion that there's a leader in all of us and none of us can actually stay on the sidelines right now because the world needs all of our voices and values to be unlocked in service of a better world. And I just thought, okay, I'm here. I have these incredible people with big brains and, and beautiful hearts around the table, and we're going to use the time well. And we used that time to co-create what has since then become known as the B-Team Compass, which is really our leadership compass, getting you know bringing together the collective vision of those diverse leaders who do not always agree on everything, but all agree that there is no future beyond planetary boundaries. All agree that every human being deserves an opportunity and to be respected and, and, and deserves to have human rights and also has human responsibilities so that we should be unlocking the true value and authentic value of all humans. And all of them agree that the rules of the game are not quite right. And there are some things that need to change to tackle corruption and, and set rules that are actually in service of our own future. The planet will likely survive us, but humanity may not survive the state it's in because of how we treat it. We might also survive. All of the B team leaders are probably, you know, part of that privileged part of the world, more and less. Um, but none of us are going to enjoy life where a lot of lives are left behind because of our inaction. So, yeah, I was intimidated, but I also just decided to show up for the task and create co-create a, a vision that we have since uh, been advancing and deepening and spreading and um, and hoping to see a lot more leaders understand that leadership has to be about being in service of a better world. You know, those, those, that group of people, you know, we've worked with a lot of them, you know, it, it tends to be the people who are, um, that, 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 that successful there can be a sense of kindness around them that they're trying to create this thing. So it's a very um, civilized uh, interaction. I guess my question is, you know, you, in, you have incredible people around this table, but even that amount of people is still a very small group, you know, in the scope of the global problem. How, how do you see the, the B team contributing to unpacking this problem, which I imagine from where you sit now, there's probably a corollary to how you sat at, in Iceland going, well, what are we going to do? It's this crazy problem yeah. that we have. You know, how do you how do you how do you take the lessons of that and apply them to this current problem? That's a good question, Jesse. Um, but I should probably correct you on one thing. When the B team leaders are together, as advanced and conscious as they are about the state of the world, well educated and uh, professional, it's not always civilized. We have quite the debates about a lot of things. Right. Well, <laughs> and I think that I, I mean, with, with Mo on any board, I imagine that you. You do have that, you know. <laughs> uh, but it is human, and 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 and, and is... being yeah, I know. Um, but Jesse, being human is uh, you yeah. know what I think is the beauty of the B team personally, and what convinced me to take the role, which I did think hard about. I was deeply honored, but also deeply impostered about my ability to do it. But the the beauty of it is, we have business leaders together with civil society leaders from all over the world with very different lived experiences, mm -hmm. and and uh, we could still add to our diversity, and that's some, uh, something I'm really working on. But 
people have really different and strong takes on the state of the world and, and, and how to solve it and different passions. So I sometimes say my role is to herd the lions because everyone is a bit alpha in a group like this, as you can imagine. And mm. so uh, it's and finding common ground. So I really do think that what I learned in Iceland post the crisis and what I've learned in my um, when I started in HR in corporate America or uh, or when I'm on the beating today or what I've learned as a mother is that um, trying to unite is always better than trying to divide. That finding common ground is far easier when you unlock your humanity because when you lock, unlock your humanity, when you show up as a human into every single interaction, then you usually unlock humanity and others. And I am so lucky that the B team leaders are people who have learned and have committed to being courageous, but being humble about the fact that we're a small piece of the puzzle. B team alone doesn't solve anything. But if we show up on behalf of humanity, we can be the tip of the spear, the catalysts that move norms in this world. And we're busy trying to move leadership norms. And before Paris in 2015, a global agreement would have been impossible if business leaders, civil society leaders and governmental leaders and all of those supporting all of those and the activists in the street screaming 1.5 to stay alive. If all of those people would not have come together, designing and agreeing and aligning 195 countries together to deliver the future we want and need would have been impossible. So. We are trying to do that now for inequality, for normalizing metrics that matter in business. And we are working on co-creating the new leadership playbook. We think the old way of leading is out. You are in the past era, if you think that being in the pursuit of financial profit alone is going to attract talent, capital, customer loyalty, earn you a social license to to operate, earn the support of your community, of your union, and so on and so forth. So we can't do it alone, but we try to lead by brave action, showing in these organizations what brave leadership looks like. And we're trying to call on ourselves and others to be 10 times bolder in showing up for this decade that needs to be a decade of action and accountability like we've never seen before. And we're trying to share those lessons and mobilize a lot of coalitions and partnership, radical collaboration, we call it, to deliver on that vision and be willing to share the wins, but as honest about the challenges too, because this is a learning journey. I don't think a single leader today has it easy anywhere. You know, but being leader. in a community of courage, that's what I like to call the B team. It's a 28 yeah. leaders who decided to be courageous together. Being in a community of courage might just be what every single leader needs. So a couple of messages to those listening could be one, make sure you have a moral compass. The B team leadership compass became that collective moral compass we have. Two, make sure you build your community of courage because and even your community of resilience because it's so much easier not to go for leadership not to go for the challenges that's easy choice but real humans real leaders show up for a moment like this historically we've never faced anything like this and if we're not going to choose to be the leaders the world needs right now when will we and then last but not least, and I think this is incredibly important, make sure that you consciously wake up every day and choose your mindset. Because if you choose to take in too much of what's going on in the world, it's easy to give in to fear and division and all of the things media brings us in abundance. But we actually can be the presidents of our own lives, even if we don't become presidents when we run for office. We can be presidents of our own minds. And it is totally up to us to choose every single morning who we are in our minds and by that probably be greater leaders than doing anything else we do because people are attracted to actually craving hope and optimism. We have to be prisoner of hope now, not prisoners of conformity. 
And there are only those two choices because we're prisoners of conformity if we're doing nothing about our broken systems. But we can be prisoners of hope when we are doing something about it. And before we know it, people will join us because the other option is impossible. You know, when you look out there, you know, you have a team of focused people. When you look out there for the average person, you know, who's maybe not a policymaker, maybe works in a factory or, or just, you know, is in school, maybe it's a young person. How should they think about environment and, and what's possible for them to, they may feel powerless, but, you know, how, how can they participate in this journey? I think that's such a good question because I think one of our biggest problems, and I'm personally upset at myself and everyone else in the so-called climate movement or business for good movement, that we often speak not to the hearts of people. We speak about something we want to happen in 2050 and it's just too far away in time. Or we speak about some scientific facts that may move people's minds but are ill digestible and really do not hit home, particularly if you if you think you're going to lose your job or you already lost your job, you can't put food on the table for your family, you don't know how to get your family health care, you don't know how to support your kids to go to school. At the end of the day, each person deserves to take care of themselves and their families. And so economic opportunity is a really big part of this. So first, I would just say to those listening, listening in who may um, not understand why we need to work on climate or environmental issues or why we need to, to have less inequality or build trust or new metrics in business, all the stuff I'm talking about. I, I would just say this. I don't think we have a, we cannot build a better future without better, clean, green jobs. If we learn something during COVID, it is that we all need nature and we all want to enjoy nature. If we learn something, we know we need to be able to breathe. We die when we can't breathe. We also know that when we don't eat good quality food, when our agricultural practices are creating food that kills us, COVID is also more likely to kill us. And the combination of all of those factors is gonna kill us. So this is personal, this hits home. And that hits home right now. So we should all be asking our leaders locally in our business where we work to think about the future is here now. Fires in our backyards, floods becoming a regular instance. Like we're all facing this, 60% of species dying. You know, the oceans full of fish with plastic. And then after that, maybe no fish. All of this is relevant to our ability to eat, to feed our family, to have jobs, to everything is, it's already here. But if we think about it through the lens of our children, if we think for a moment of the world we want to leave for our children, then it really becomes personal, at least for me. Because our children deserve to have a world where they have the opportunity to have the kind of life that we've been able to join yet many people not even be able to join. And the people who have never known the abundance that those of us living in the global north have enjoyed, deserve to know that their countries are not worth drowning or that their countries are not void of food. And if we worry about immigration and too many people fleeing from Latin America to America or from Africa to Europe, the best way to stop that migration pattern is actually to tackle climate change. Most of the refugees and immigration crisis is due to drought, lack of food, lack of ability there of people to feed their own families. So we are all in this one world together. We all benefit from the clean air, the clean food, the natural life, um, the social fabric that is created when we tackle these big challenges. And each one of us can do our little bit. We can make this personal in our own lives. There are lots of ways to do that. Think about using the power of our wallet, our voice, our vote, our values. Think about how we, how we actually get a little angry at the people who are in leadership who are not making this their business. Right. And that is happening. Look at the kids in the street. Look at the employees walking out or refusing to work. And look at the investors 
hey, if the big investors now know we need to have uh, climate resilient portfolios, then we should all think hard about if we haven't figured it out, if the money has figured it out. Um, so, and that's happening fast. So this is personal, it's to all of us. It doesn't have anything to do with politics. I've seen all kinds of politics all over the world. And at the end of the day, this is an issue about humanity, all of it. And it has nothing to do with politics. Everyone listen to what Hala is saying. Yeah. So much wisdom here, information. Um, we are so grateful you came to, to talk yeah, with us. Thank you, Hala. This was great. It's wonderful. People go to the bteam.org to learn more. There's, it, it, as Hala just said, you can do a lot. We can do a lot. You know, you can you can support businesses that you believe are doing the right thing. There's so many ways yeah. that we can we haven't that's what that's what she's talking about. I think that's what the B team is talking about. Yeah. So don't give up because we yeah. are all partners of hope. At least I know Jesse is a relentless optimist. And I would I say you are too, Hala. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am sometimes told I am, and I'm yeah. proud to belong to a group that Christiana Figueres, often called the architect of the Paris Agreement, uh, coined, yeah. which is that she chooses to be a stubborn optimist. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy. And that doesn't mean we don't recognize the pain and suffering. It's everywhere. We're all feeling it in some way, but some are feeling it a lot more than those of us in yeah. this conversation. But we are only going to feel worse if we give into that fear every day and we're only going to feel better and stand a greater chance at creating the kind of communities we want to live in if we decide to lean in to hope to stubborn optimism and be the leaders the world needs right now and that is given to all of us to choose thank, thank you, you all thank very you much. So much thanks for having me yeah, yeah of course that was great look forward to talking more i'll call you soon please do